Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Wilson Center, uh, to a program that the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States is unusually proud to be putting on. We are very glad to be spending this morning with Ambassador Winston Lord, and we'll be speaking with him about the new book, Kissinger on Kissinger, Reflections on Diplomacy, Grand Strategy, and Leadership. This is the only oral history on Dr. Kissinger, and uh, Ambassador Lord worked on this with KT McFarland. Uh, it is available, I should mention, for sale out in the lobby. Uh, and it is not simply uh, an oral history of Dr. Kissinger. It is also the portrait of a period and the portrait of a set of attitudes and skill sets and understandings about America's place in the world and its foreign policy uh, that many people feel is, is lacking today. It covers not only the opening to China, breakthroughs with the Soviet Union, but also Middle East shuttle diplomacy and negotiations to end the Vietnam War. Uh, its subject in many ways is the question of what diplomacy is. And I was I noted that a lot of the passages that I had underlined uh, clearly had also been underlined by Peggy Noonan uh, for her piece in the Wall Street Journal, and particularly Dr. Kissinger's uh, line that everything depends on some conception of the future. Uh, Ambassador Winston Lord is well known to many of you today. Uh, you've had the pleasure of working with him uh, in many cases, and a special welcome to old colleagues from Am Embassy Beijing. Uh, Ambassador Lord graduated from Yale and then from Fletcher, where he was first in his class. He then served from 1969 to 1973 on the National Security Council's planning staff with Dr. Kissinger, to whom he was a special assistant. He accompanied Dr. Kissinger to Beijing uh, in 1971. Uh, there's a very famous story about that. I don't know if you'll be relaying that today, uh, and was one of the principal drafters then of the 1972 Shanghai Communique. He was also a top assistant on Vietnam negotiations and was present at every one of Dr. Kissinger's meetings with North Vietnam from 1970 to 1973, and in that capacity was also a principal drafter of the Paris Peace Accords. He later served as the director of the State Department's Office of Policy Planning, as ambassador to China from 1985 to 1989 under President Reagan, and then from 1993 to 1997 as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Uh, he later served as the president of the Council on Foreign Relations and on a list of boards and projects ongoing, uh, which are too lengthy to mention. I also, on a personal note, um, would like to say that he was uh, the ambassador when I first got to Beijing uh, as a diplomat in 1987. I had the pleasure of serving under you and was deeply impressed. During my first week there, uh, you always invited one junior officer to attend country team meetings. And during my first week, I had the opportunity to sit in and that, as well as the great amount of interest that you showed in junior staff and that uh, Betty Bao also showed, in those days, and this may have been the last time, the ambassador's residence was the premier cultural salon in China. Uh, and if you happened to, to drop by for some reason in the middle of the day, you were likely to run into people like uh, the great actor Ying Ruo Cheng, the heads of the Beijing People's Art Theater, uh, leading writers. It was really a, a marvelous time to, to serve with you, and so I wanted to thank you for all of that. Uh, Ambassador Lords did sometimes ask too much of junior staff. Uh, you may not remember this, but in 1988, we played basketball against the Soviet Union. And we were out on the court at the same time, and Ambassador Lords set a pick for me about 40 feet out and said, shoot, shoot. And this was well outside the range of my reliable jumper, which is about nine feet. That was before uh, the three-point. Uh, <laughs> this is before three-pointers. Uh, and so I, I threw up a brick. Um, we won the game anyway because our team was primarily made up of members of the U.S. Marine Detachment and not of foreign service officers. That saved us. Uh, but a marvelous time, a great ambassador, and a great book. We look forward to hearing about it and are very glad that you'll be joined in this discussion by our own uh, Ambassador Stapleton Roy, the founding director emeritus of the Kissinger Institute, who needs no introduction to this group. And so with that, I will leave it to the two of you for a much anticipated discussion. And we're going to ask uh, you, Ambassador Lord, to lead off uh, with whatever you would like to say by way of opening with the book. Uh, 
and then uh, we'll have a discussion between the two of you before we open it up to those in attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for that incredible introduction. Uh, I can't think of a more appropriate place to launch this book than here. After all, it is the Kissinger Center. It's run by Robert Daly, and as Robert said, uh, we work closely together, and he did that extremely closely with my wife as well, including the kind of issues he just mentioned. I would also mention the production of the Kane Mutiny. We brought Charlton Heston over to be the director of that, and that was quite an experience. Uh, Robert has obviously emerged as one of the leading China watchers uh, in this country. Uh, I won't say China expert, because I think a China expert is an oxymoron. Uh, or just a plain moron. It, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's so unpredictable and so contradictory. And then to have State Roy uh, in conversation with me, what could be more appropriate? After all, he worked for Kissinger. He's been heavily involved in China affairs, including the normalization negotiations. Uh, he was in Moscow when we opened up to China and began the triangular uh, diplomacy. So, Steve, you could have done this book as well. And I look forward to our conversation. I, I will say in front of him what I say behind his back. Uh, Stape is one of the very small handful of outstanding diplomats of my generation, our generation. In fact, you're still older than I am by a year or two, I think. But in any event, I mean that. I'm older than you, but you're senior to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stape and I have had each other's back. We've worked on a lot of issues together. When I was ambassador, he supported me during a crisis uh, when he was deputy assistant secretary in the East Asian Bureau. And when he was ambassador, I was assistant secretary there. I supported him. It's a lesser crisis, but it showed that we had each other's back. So I'm particularly pleased to have you uh, uh, moderating this discussion. A couple of quick words about the book. First, you notice it's a, a little white book. And I told Kissinger that we did this because we wanted to distinguish it from the writings of Chairman Mao and Henry Kissinger, namely Little Red Books. I'll try it again, Little Red Books. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we are thinking of a, a new title, however. I sent word of this to some friends at press release, <clears throat> one of whom was Tom Brokaw, and he got the notice on a small iPhone, so to cut off the last two letters of the title. So he immediately ran out on, to get the book, thinking the book was Kissinger on Kissing. <laughs> 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 so we think we might, we might change the title. Uh, I don't want to take too long. I, I do hope you buy it, of course. Uh, but I, more importantly, I think uh, it, it's accessible. It's 175 pages. So I think even for those who are familiar with some of the issues, it'll be a very accessible, more so than 1,000-page memoirs of what happened. But it's beyond the four main issues which are discussed, namely China, Russia, Middle East, and Vietnam. Uh, Henry holds forth, and we urged him to talk about the need for strategy, the qualities of leadership, how you negotiate, et cetera. But more importantly, I think for newer generations, almost anybody under 40 or 50, uh, this would be an introduction to a period that's sort of ancient history to them. And it was amazing that Henry, in his mid-90s, could reflect back on this period with uh, a memory that was incredible. He not only had the strategic context and some of the milestones, but he peppered it with revealing anecdotes and personal portraits of leaders that really are quite, are quite interesting. So it's his only oral history, uh, but I think it's more than that, and uh, I, I hope you'll enjoy it, and we'll get into some of the subject matter when we turn this over now to Steve. Uh, thank you, Wynn. As he mentioned, he and I go back a long way. Uh, he was our third ambassador to Beijing, and I was the fifth. And when I was the deputy assistant secretary, uh, I can't tell you how easy it made the job to have an ambassador who could give you instructions in Washington on what our policy approach should be. <laughs> and then all he had to do was carry it out. Uh, and certainly, and then he kept me t really informed in, in Beijing when he was the assistant secretary uh, to a degree that is unusual for ambassadors to be consulted on things that usually Washington handles on its own. So uh, we do indeed go back a long way, and we both have long, long exposure to Henry Kissinger. Uh, my favorite 
Kissinger joke, as told by Kissinger himself, uh, is that he was at a cocktail party, and this woman came up to him and said, uh, Dr. Kissinger, I hear you're a fascinating man. Fa fascinate me. <laughs> when was, was Dr. Kissinger a fascinating man, and uh, did he fascinate you? Yeah, he, uh, he did. He also stretched my patience and my nerves. As I uh, outlined in the, in the forward to the book, I do give a, a mini personal portrait of Henry to, uh, toward the end, which I introduced by saying the agony and the ecstasy. There's no question uh, he tested your patience. I was ready to quit about once a week. The hours were incredible. Uh, he would uh, clearly expect the best out of you. Uh, the classic story many of you have heard is that I used to draft speeches for him, and I'd go in with a draft, and he'd come in the next day and say, is this the best you can do? And I said, I thought so. I'll try it again. I went in the next couple of days with another draft. He said, are you sure it's the best you can do? And I said, I, I thought so, but let me try. This happened six or seven times, and I was getting really exasperated. So the next time, he said, is this the best you can do? He said, Henry, damn it, I've tweaked every paragraph, every semicolon. I can't do any better than this. So then he looked at me and smiled and said, in that case, I guess now I'll read it. <laughs> that story is about 50% true, but the point is, in all, in all seriousness, he, he would stretch you, and I've always been uh, grateful for that. Uh, it's hard not to fall into cliches about the brilliance of this person. Did he have flaws? Of course he did, uh, and there were times when he was exasperating, but I don't know of any great man that doesn't, doesn't have flaws. Uh, he had a great sense of humor, which eased uh, situations in times of tension. Uh, above all, he really did not like yes men or yes women. When I joined the NSC staff, I started in the what is now the Eisenhower building across from the West Wing, sort of a NSC policy planning staff, and we would send him memos about the future or about current policy, and I sent several that my boss let me go through with my name on it, uh, criticizing some of the Nixon and Kissinger policies in a respectful but hard-hitting way. And it was because of those memos, not in spite of them, that he hired me as his special assistant. And I'll be forever grateful for all kinds of favors, which I, I mentioned in the Ford, including sitting in on the famous Nixon Mao summit and including me with a Vietnam protester who was outside the the gates at a very tense time, and uh, we went breakfast. I think really Henry might have saved his life. There are aspects of Henry that uh, don't enter into the public view. I'm not here to defend every last flaw. I am here to say that I do think he's one of the great uh, diplomats uh, in American history, and I think the, his achievements, uh, some of which are in this book, but others are in the Ford administration, which we don't get to, uh, I think are lasting and, and help to form the architecture we're working within today. When it really was an unusual period in U.S. foreign policy uh, because you had a president who really looked at the world in terms of grand strategy, and you had a national security advisor who shared that global strategic vision but also was a master of the tactics of trying to turn strategic vision into practical diplomatic accomplishments. In the six years that Dr. Kissinger worked with President uh, uh, Nixon, we had the breakthrough to China, which really was the turning point in the Cold War. Uh, I was in Moscow at the time, and the impact on the Russians, who recognized instantly the strategic significance of the Americans getting a breakthrough to, uh, to China. Uh, the SALT-1 agreement uh, also took place. Uh, on the Soviet side and paved the way for detente that ultimately created the conditions in which Gorbachev emerged and it brought down the uh, Soviet Union. The Middle East breakthrough was really unforeseen by anybody. Uh, they brought about a strategic reversal um, of the balance in the Middle East where the Soviet Union had established close relations with both Egypt and Syria. It had become in the arms supplier uh, to key countries in the Middle East. And Kissinger and Nixon were able to 
reverse that, essentially end the Soviet strategic role at that time, and it paved the way for the Camp David agreements between Israel and um, Egypt that occurred uh, after the uh, uh, Nixon administration. And we forget this. They negotiated a, a, an end to the Vietnam War. That, in retrospect, that's looked at as a disastrous end. But the fact of the matter is the agreement that was reached in 1973 was on U.S. terms because the key Vietnamese demand throughout the negotiations had been that we, we could only have an agreement if we got rid of the South Vietnamese government. And the U.S. side would not cave in on that subject, and eventually the North Vietnamese agreed to having the South Vietnamese government remain in place. But the agreement was unimplementable on the U.S. side because it had lost its domestic base. And this gives you some interesting lessons about foreign policies. They shouldn't be formulated in terms of domestic attitudes, but they cannot be implemented effectively if you don't have the domestic support for doing that. When four great achievements in a relatively short period of time, what are the lessons that we can derive from that period that might be relevant to our foreign policy today? <clears throat> First, let me just take two of those to give an example of a uh, strategic approach and then segue into your question more directly. In the case of China, uh, Nixon and Kissinger each approached it independently as something we ought to be working on. Nixon wrote his famous Foreign Affairs article in 67. He saw opening up with China after 22 years of hostility and the Korean War as important for world order, that you needed to get a, a fifth of the world's people uh, involved and if you're going to have stability and peace over the long run. And Kissinger's emphasis was more how we could exploit it against the Soviet Union in order to have better relations with Moscow, but in order to get their attention. But they converged on this. Uh, and when we had the border clashes in 69, uh, at that point we were negotiating a lot of substance with the Soviets. We weren't doing too well and had absolutely no contact with China. And yet, when those clashes erupted, the, the Soviet ambassador, Dabrinin, was keeping Kissinger carefully informed, which suggested to him that uh, the, the Russians were looking for a pretext for even greater uh, expansion. And Nixon and Kissinger decided that it was best to side with the weaker against the stronger, uh, if you will, anti-hegemony, which found its way into the Shanghai communique and bound us together with China. So as a result of that, you had the famous triangular diplomacy where we had uh, better relations with each of those countries than they had with each other, which unfortunately today is just the opposite, where the triangle were in the worst shape. The, the, Russia and China, I don't think they're going to forge an alliance over the long term. There's too many contradictions, but clearly uh, in the triangle we're looking a lot less uh, good shape than we did f uh, 40 years ago. The other quick example is the Middle East. Uh, as Steve suggested, uh, the Middle East, except for a couple of exceptions like Jordan and Saudi Arabia, was essentially under the sway of Soviet arms, and they thought that maybe they could get land back or peace from Israel by the pressure of Soviet arms. Nixon and Kissinger wanted to move on the Middle East, but the time wasn't ripe until the Yom Kippur War in October 73. And then, again, a sense of strategy, since they always decided they wanted to prove to the Arab states that the only way they could get progress was with American mediation, not Soviet arms. Kissinger moved at just the precise right time. The, the Egyptians attacked the Israelis uh, and the Syrians too. Uh, <coughs> uh, and actually, for the first time, Arabs made real advances against Israel. Uh, and then Israel, of course, rebounded and fought back and surrounded the Egyptian army. Kissinger moved at that precise moment to try to freeze the situation with a ceasefire because he figured for the first time, uh, before the Egyptian army was wiped out, because he saw that for the first time the Arabs had some sense of dignity, that they had had some success, they hadn't been humiliated by the Israelis, and so they might be better prepared to enter negotiations, which, by the way, was Sadat's strategy. His attack was not an end in itself. It was to produce negotiations. That's Kissinger calling out. Am I getting it wrong, Henry? <laughs> <laughs>
At the same time, for the I first, cut him off. at the same time, for the first time, Israel was sobered up. They they realized that they weren't quite as secure as they thought. So both sides were in the mood to negotiate, and indeed they did. And we led the shuttle diplomacy. Now, I would say that the grand strategy of those years can't be, or hasn't been, but doesn't have to be totally replicated in subsequent administrations. They, we had a situation in the late sixties early 70s, where we had the nuclear standoff with the Russians. You had no contact with China. You had a Vietnam War going on. You had the Soviets dominating the Middle East. So you needed some conceptual strength and so on. That's always important in foreign policy. You've got to have some sense of where you want to end up, not just tactical decisions based on discrete events. But uh, successive administrations have had some success without this grand strategy, but having some sense of what they're up to. I mean, Bush and Bush won, and where he said we pushed back uh, the invasion of Kuwait with Iraq, but we don't go over and try to throw over the government. Or we end the Cold War by giving Gorbachev some face, uh, or the reunification of Germany. Or uh, <coughs> the Clinton administration on the Kosovo Agreement, or uh, Obama on Iran, figuring there's a lot of problems with Iran, but it's better to deal with them if they're not nuclear than, uh, and so you get a partial agreement and try to s seal that off as you deal with the other problems or climate change and so on. So <clears throat> I'm not saying you had to have the brilliance of the Nixon-Kissinger era in terms of conceptual strength, because it's a different world, but you've got to have some sense of where you're going. And I, d I don't want to, and I think State wants that we don't want to get another anti-Trump rally here. We're all sick of, it, of talking about this, and so I won't dwell on it. Uh, but you have a situation now where there's no sense of strategy at all. I and mean, we've gone of comparing Kissinger and Nixon to, say, tactical diplomacy, and now we have to compare it to tweeter diplomacy, uh, which is the you know, most extreme example of acting by impulse, narcissism, uh, phony deals, uh, bluffs, which others understand. So you're going to wipe out North Korea, and then you, you love letters with Kim Jong-un, you go back and forth. Uh, you're trying to implement tough sanctions because your advisors on Russia, but you cozy up to Putin. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks with Iran, we got talk of, uh, we send uh, aircraft carriers and other uh, assets to the area because Iran's threatening us. Then we hear Trump a few days ago say, no, 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 I don't want a war, and he's going to have to rein in this hawkish Bolton. And now this morning or yesterday he tweets again threatening to wipe Iran out. I mean, you just can't conduct policy like that. Uh, you need a strategy. I'll take one example, then we ought to get on to other questions. But for example, with China, a great interest to this group, uh, to Trump's credit, he has begun to blow the whistle on the mercantilistic and protectionist policies of, uh, of China, but he doesn't have a clue how to deal with China overall. Yes, I think correct to describe them as strategic competitors, but uh, it's either falling in love with Xi or blustering. Uh, we'll get into the tariff war if you want later, but the point is, if you want to deal with China, you need a strategic uh, approach, not just this tactical one on one or two issues. And so in each of the three components I consider most essential strategically with China, he is messing us up uh, domestically, get our act together, not only uh, get away from polarization and get some things done, invest in infrastructure, build up our competitive strengths versus China. Not to mention looking like the city on the hill and promoting democracy and human rights, which he totally ignores. In fact, he loves autocrats. So our soft power and our domestic hard power uh, is suffering. Then allies, you need allies with China. On trade, I'm happy to say that in the last few days, it looks like he's postponing auto tariffs and he's trying to get the Canadian-Mexican deal in place uh, so that we can at least have a more united front against China. But if you want to compete with China, you want to work with your allies, not pick fights with them and love dictators. And then finally, multilateral institutions where we should and have taken the lead and to pull out of uh, Iran and climate deals and lead the field to China. Uh, not only do we forfeit areas where we can cooperate with China, but we're leaving the field to them. And another example, of course, is the Trans-Pacific uh, Partner Trade Pact, uh, which he withdrew. And if you want to deal with China economically as well as geopolitically, we needed that. So uh, I do think the lessons are still applicable today. I think they're applicable to all administrations, but I think it's much more acute uh, in the current situation. When let me um, link those very interesting observations to the book. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Kissinger notes in the book uh, the difficulties caused for the Nixon-Kissinger foreign policy uh, during the Nixon administration, the difficulties caused by views in the United States that the Soviet Union was inherently an evil state, that negotiating with the USSR uh, granted it moral equivalence, and therefore somehow it was wrong to be negotiating with them, and that the culmination of the Cold War had to be some kind of overall diplomatic confrontation or a war. These concepts are now being applied to China uh, and arguably could be complicating the problem of trying to sort out the areas where our strategic rivalry with China is a dominant factor and those areas where we need to cooperate with China uh, for both narrow U.S. national interests and for global reasons such as climate change. Uh, could you reflect on that a bit? Sure. I'll try to keep this answer shorter so we can get to more questions. Uh, <clears throat> I think China's been overreaching, but we're in danger of overreacting. So uh, a quick advertisement for, I think, the most appropriate policy toward China, then I'll get more directly to your question, is a, a report put out by a task force of uh, longtime China watchers uh, by the Asia Society and University of California, San Diego, Oval Shell, and Susan Shirt called Course Correction. And I, d I do recommend this as being firmer with China, but also seeking out areas where we can compete and do it smartly and where we can cooperate. First, let's distinguish the Russians are interfering with our democracy directly. The Chinese are interfering. They're trying to influence our public opinion, sometimes in ways that are unacceptable, but they're not trying to actually overthrow our, our system. And in terms of the Cold War, it's one thing with the Soviet Union, we were confronting them. We had absolutely no economic connections, and now, of course, there's tremendous interdependence uh, with China. <clears throat> I do think we have to push back in certain areas, because I think China has gotten more aggressive uh, overseas, South China Sea, pressures on Taiwan, pressures on Hong Kong, its military buildup, which is asymmetrical versus our strengths, much more repressive regime at home, and then flaunting these values overseas as a different model and interfering in our and other countries' societies. And then, of course, the mercantilistic and protectionist uh, economic policies. Uh, so I do think some uh, pushback is required. But uh, it ought to be done in a way that I suggested earlier in terms of our domestic strengths. We certainly have assets. China's got huge problems. Just look at the 14 neighbors with ter uh, terrorism or nuclear weapons or ancient enmities of border conflicts. We've got Canada, Mexico, and the two oceans, uh, all kinds of other strengths that we have. So we ought to play to those strengths and not be worried about uh, overtaken by, by China. I, Joe Biden, I think, was misquoted the other day. He said, we don't have to worry about China. That's a stupid statement by itself. But what I think he meant was we have enough inherent strengths, they have enough important uh, problems that we can compete with them, uh, compete with them smartly. So yes, we've got to push back. We've got to be more careful about uh, 5G technology, uh, intellectual property theft by students, and so on, but not to start banning them all or overreacting in that case, uh, we ought to, in my view, get back uh, to the TPP in order to enjoin what is now 11 nations uh, in order to have multilateral pressure. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I think we are in danger of demonizing China. We have a new committee. What is it called? The committee, uh, the president. Committee danger, on the president has danger. Been re resuscitated. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I yield to no one. Am I feeling we have to be tougher with China? But we still have areas we can cooperate. I do not rule out uh, China going back to a more constructive course. Under Xi, who I think has been a lot part of the problem, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic in the short run. But if we have self-confidence, if we compete smartly, if we push back where we should, if we join with our allies and, and reassert our efforts in multilateral institutions, uh, I have every reason to think we can compete with these guys. And I, I don't rule out the current, look, the debate here, and one last comment, there are a lot of those, and many of whom I respect, like Jim Mann, who may be in the audience, and others, that we're all naive and we all thought China's going to become a democracy because of uh, capitalism and the middle class and so on. 
I think some of us were optimistic. I was fairly optimistic at the Tiananmen Square where you had millions of people demonstrating. Uh, but we always hedged in terms of allies and military uh, and not assuming this was going to happen. And I don't think we should be overly pessimistic today for the middle and long term. Uh, I think if we compete smartly with China and if we can have our allies and friends with us, one cannot rule out China returning to a somewhat more constructive course. When Dr. Kissinger emphasizes in the book uh, the importance of the anti-hegemony clauses in the Shanghai Communique when it was issued in uh, 1972, uh, I confess that I had to rush for a dictionary to find out what hegemony meant. Uh, I was never sure whether it was hegemony or hegemony. Uh, <laughs> To my knowledge, it was the first time in American diplomatic history, actually, that we had used that word. Uh, but it clearly played a very important role in the breakthrough uh, that turned the course of the Cold War, because both the United States and China were opposed to Soviet hegemony in the world. You could argue that China's foreign policy has been consistent in that it went from opposing Soviet hegemony to being unhappy with a sole superpower, which amounted, mm -hmm. in essence, to opposing American hegemony in the world. But now we are accusing China of having the goal of becoming not only a regional hegemon, but actually a global hegemon. Is that an accurate assessment of what China's goals are? And how would you think how should we deal with this question? Should we try to reach an agreement with China on opposing global hegemony? Well, if you mean a written agreement on another communique of some sort, no, that's just a slippery slope, and there's no way we can construct that, particularly with the two current regimes in Washington and Beijing, and we make everybody nervous around the world. However, uh, I think we can move in that direction conceptually, but it's going to be tough right now. Uh, let me first say that... Uh, the jury is out on what China's goals are. I, I, look, they have a Middle Kingdom complex. They're the center of the world. They, they ruled the world essentially for 4,000, 5,000 years, and they had a lousy century uh, in terms of humiliation and foreign uh, domination. And, of course, they play on that for nationalistic reasons now. And I think ever since 2008, the financial crisis where we screwed up and they seemed to be doing better, not to mention the Olympics coming out party, uh, started with Hu Jintao, but more under Xi Jinping. They now feel that they should take their rightful place. In many ways, they have a right to take that rightful place. Uh, I don't rule out, frankly, certainly they're dominating Asia and even global influence. They're certainly reaching for that now, uh, and even to over the long term to a point of threatening the United States. But because of my self-confidence in the U.S., if we get our act together, and the allies we have compared to China, I think that's unlikely, and I think they'll come to that conclusion. Right now, of course, China's biding its time. I think they're leaving uh, aside for now their final decision. Uh, they they want to gain on us in Asia and, and, and the world situation, uh, and they'll decide when they're stronger uh, in another couple of decades whether to be even more aggressive. So I, I don't rule out a, a fairly ominous uh, future, but I think uh, we can prevent it. Now, what I would do, even though I wouldn't try to negotiate a document, but it's going to be impossible with Trump and, and Xi, frankly, is to, uh, we ought to have strategic discussions with the Chinese along the following lines. And you could do it with Kissinger and Zhou Enlai. You cannot do it now. But conceptually, you're, you're, what you're getting at is correct. Namely, we fear that China wants to drive us out of Asia, maybe take over the world. They fear we're, we're, we're containing them, trying to keep them down. We ought to have a discussion, and it's tough, which in effect says we say to them, look, we, 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 we mean it when we say we're not opposing your rise. You have a right to have more seats at the table and more influence, but you really have to abide by the international rules and norms. Uh, you can try to adjust some to reflect your strength, but the basic fundamentals of a system which enabled you to grow dramatically uh, have to be respected. But within that framework, uh, we're welcoming you, and we can cooperate in certain areas. Uh, the Chinese, in turn, have got to say to us, 
Uh, we have an interest in uh, Asia. It's right on our doorstep. We have a legitimate case here, but we're not trying to drive you away. You, you've got interest, too, and there ought to be room for both of us in the Pacific. Uh, same with specific issues like North Korea, where China has legitimate security interests, but they've always put stability of the regime over nuclear weapons uh, deprival, and that's been a, a, a problem there. So we ought to talk to them about their security concerns. So we ought to have this kind of discussion uh, in order to reach a more stable world system. But I'm obviously very pessimistic with our current leadership. One final simple question, and then we'll turn to um, uh, questions from the audience. Dr. Kissinger constantly emphasizes in the book uh, the need for, and I'm quoting th this language comes from the book, the need for strategic blueprints, a vision of the future, a sense of the desired end state to guide tactical foreign policy decisions toward a strategic goal. But our political system is attaching essentially no importance to having presidential candidates who are prepared to provide this sort of strategic leadership that President Nixon and, and National Security Advisor Kissinger were able to provide at that critical moment in the Cold War. How do we deal with this problem? Because we are still the most powerful country in the world but we've had four presidents in a row. I mean, this problem didn't begin with President Trump. Uh, whatever you think about the foreign policy that was carried out by our earlier presidents, the fact is the presidents themselves were not prepared by experience or by their own way of thinking to provide strategic guidance as to how the United States should be exercising our influence in the world. How, sh how can we deal with that problem? <laughs> that was in a few words. That's the easy question. Uh, <laughs> why don't we go right to the audience? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, actually, uh, well, uh, uh, no. Uh, very uh, quickly. Again, I want to emphasize what I said earlier. I'm not saying we have to have the kind of strategic approach, grand strategy of Nixon and Kissinger, but we do have to have some common sense. We do have to have a president who's willing to believe his intelligence community instead of dismissing them. Uh, someone who understands for a rational foreign policy process, you've got to fill the top positions in government uh, and that you can't within 72 hours go from hard to soft to hard on Iran, for example. So uh, <clears throat> I'm not asking for a very high bar here. Uh, I, I don't think a president has to be strategically adept at at foreign policy, as long as he's got some advisors who can help him. I mean, I don't think Ford, that was his strength, but Kissinger certainly helped him. I don't think that was Reagan's strength, but Schultz helped, uh, you know, helped him. And I would argue that our domestic scene is still the most urgent. And I'd rather have a president who's good on that, which in turn will help us compete with China and in our foreign policy uh, in general. So uh, I don't want to get into particular candidates, but certainly Biden knows a lot about foreign policy, to take that example. Some of the other candidates know less, but that's not crippling if they get the right advisors. My own thesis is that in the presidential debates, we should stop asking the candidates what their policy positions are in particular areas. Rather, we should grill them on what they have done to prepare themselves to be president. Have they learned economics? Have they visited foreign countries? Have they met with foreign leaders, et cetera? In other words, I think that our system needs to put much greater emphasis on the requirement that if you are ambitious and want to be president, there are certain things you have to do to qualify to hold that office, and we're not doing it at the present time. I, I fully agree. Uh, One last guy. I noticed Jim Mann is here. I do want to give him his due. He was ahead of almost everybody years ago about not getting over-optimistic uh, about China and assuming certain things. Uh, I would argue that we were not quite as naive, as stupid as he thinks some of us were, <laughs> but I, I, I give him full credit for being way ahead of the power curve on the threat coming from China. I just feel we still should not overreact to it. Well, thank you. Uh, let's go to uh, the audience now, and we'll start uh, way in the back in the, in the middle there. <laughs> 
Wait, please wait for the microphone. Sorry. Mr. Lord, there's no reason that you would remember this, but I interviewed you in 1977 for my Oxford thesis on the U.S.-China detente. I was a Foreign Service Reserve officer, and of course the information that was available was much more uh, limited publicly at that time. I hope you got an A on your thesis. Sir. Well, um, <laughs> I continued a after um, that, but I'm curious about how uh, Kissinger educated himself on China since that was not something he was really familiar with when he came into the administration. Um, and I don't know if you've read Margaret McMillan's book since she has had access to much more of what's been declassified and what the Chinese have right. had. That's, that's one question. And then when you get into the Chinese perspective more recently, during the Iraq War, they were busy locking down mineral resources in various parts of the world, and they have been busy developing um, a global navy and taking a long-term strategic view, whereas we tend to take a, a shorter-term perspective, and if the two of you are able to comment on some of that, they've, along with their history of thousands of years of, of presence, they are looking at foreign policy and economic policy generally in a longer term perspective than we do. Okay, I'll let State take the second question. And the first one on Kissinger's education. It's a very good point. He came in essentially knowledgeable about world affairs, certainly nuclear arms and so on, but mostly a European expert. And w one of the genius dimensions of Henry was that he not only learned how to deal with the Chinese, but he learned how to deal in the Middle East and, and with the Vietnamese and others that he had had no real contact with. Uh, he got a memo from uh, Nixon on February 1, 1969, saying get in touch with the Chinese. That's how urgent the priority was for the president and, and also for Kissinger. And so from then on, uh, he began to educate himself. He called in everybody from China scholars across the country to Andre Malol of France and so on. And I want to point out, yes, there's no question that under the Nixon foreign policy was one out of the White House and the State Department and other agencies were cut out of some of the secret negotiations. Uh, no one's going to deny that. That does not in any way minimize the contributions of the experts in the bureaucracy. From the very beginning, as we were taking some public steps to sort of indicate the direction we were going and as we were searching secretly for intermediary where we ended up with Pakistan, we asked for all kinds of information from the intelligence agency, from the State Department, the Pentagon. They thought it was just general support. They didn't realize as we got closer in 71 that it was for an actual trip. But whether it was that or once the secret trip was announced and we began ready for the president's trip and the State Department was included in the delegation, we drew heavily on them personally as well as their writings. Now, it still doesn't mean they weren't cut out of things. I mean, I was in the Mao summit and the Secretary of State wasn't. Uh, but, and the, the Shanghai communique got criticized at the last minute because the State Department was excluded from the negotiations, which they shouldn't have been, and Marshall Green had some very good points, which we tried to reopen, and we did make some progress. But my point here is that not only did Kissinger educate himself, but he relied heavily uh, on the experts around the government. Do you want to take the second question? Or? Well, I'll just, uh, ju I'll just add a couple of points. One, Dr. Kissinger did end up with some very good um, China specialists on his staff in the White House. That's right, John Holdridge, for example. John Holdridge, for example, um, who among the least moronic of the China experts. Right. Uh, and, uh, and he drew on their wisdom. But I think it also illustrates when you have to deal with hundreds of countries in the world, that you can't be an expert on every one of them. And therefore, it's particularly important that you have some understanding of how diplomacy functions, how dealing with this country has an immediate impact on countries elsewhere. And both President Nixon and, President and Secretary Kissinger, or uh, National Security Advisor Kissinger at the time, had that understanding. If you don't believe me, go on and do an internet search uh, on an article that Dr. Kissinger wrote in 1968 
before he had been approached by uh, uh, Nixon to be his national security advisor. It's called Current Issues of American Foreign Policy. And if you read it now, it is stunning how many of the insights in that article are still relevant to our foreign policy today. So it wasn't expertise on China that enabled Dr. Kissinger to play a helpful role to President uh, Nixon in achieving the breakthrough, but it was an understanding of foreign policy and how you need to take into account the interests of both sides in order to reach mutually acceptable understandings. Okay, um, in the middle in the red top, and then we'll go to Jim. If you could get a little closer to the mic, please. Yeah. Is it on? Oh. It's not working with it. I just okay. Got well, that's okay. Right there. Yeah, I'm not sure I heard everything, but quickly, is China's role in the North Korean issue. Uh, I think, on the whole, they've been more the problem than the solution. Uh, they have legitimate security interests. We ought to be talking to them about that. We've tried, I think, without real success, in a sense, saying to reassure them if there's unification, which is a euphemistic way of saying regime change, uh, that their legitimate security concerns can be respected that, say, American troops wouldn't move further north, might even be withdrawn over time, that if refugees <coughs> pour over the border into China, we'd help them out uh, <coughs> financially. The nuclear weapons would be taken care of by the UN, not by the PLA or the 82nd Airborne, uh, these kinds of <coughs> assurances. Uh, but having said that, China, above all, does not want a unified democratic country uh, on their border, and therefore, even though they don't want nuclear weapons on their border, They've consistently undercut and watered down uh, sanctions. Now, they've been better for a while under Trump, but they're slipping again, uh, partly because of Trump's mismanagement of this issue and Kim's uh, tactics. Uh, but on the whole, uh, pressure on North Korea, which I think is required, whether to negotiate or to j contain them, uh, is, is, is undercut by the Chinese. And uh, I think... Uh, there's been too much talk of China's help in this issue. I don't think they've been all that helpful, in my opinion. Okay, if we uh, bring a microphone up front, please, for Jim Mann. Hi, thanks for this. Is this working? Uh, this, your lucid presentation. I want to ask two quick questions that involve the early days. The first is, at what point, you're working alongside Kissinger, does he really take on China as his thing? The reason I ask is the memoirs show, I think it's Al Haig writes that in that February, Kissinger shows up maybe from the Oval Office and says, rolls his eyes and says, China, the boss wants to establish a relationship with China um, as, if, as if he's incredulous. And I wondered whether it's, you know, it gradually became part of his identity, and I, didn't, I don't know whether that was the secret trip or before that. And then the other question, on the secret trip, Kissinger writes in his memoirs, Taiwan was barely discussed at that first meeting, and the memcons, which came out later, showed that Taiwan was indeed discussed right, right. at the beginning of the first meeting. Um, <coughs> so how do you... I'd like to hear your Yeah, let me go on both those. And if I leave something out, come back to me. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, the first year from 69 February to 70, I was not a special assistant. I was not privy to all the inside discussions on the Vietnam negotiation in China. After that, I was involved in all of them. I was lucky to be paired with him and with experts on all the major issues. So I can't absolutely tell you his inner thoughts. I would not have talked to him that much about China and so on. But the, the Hague account just seems unreal to me. Uh, I know from Kissinger's own writings and previous writings that he, he, he thought China was important. As I said, more for balancing uh, 
uh, purposes than for world order purposes, which was Nixon's emphasis. Secondly, he's too damn smart to understand that opening up a China would be a geopol geopolitical earthquake. If you don't think Henry would want to be in charge of that, uh, I've got a Brooklyn Bridge to sell you. So clearly, uh, I think he was very interested in China from the beginning. There's no question. By the time I got there, which was February 1970, still early in the explorations, he was clearly dominant. So I just think the Hague account is totally misleading. For Henry to say we didn't discuss Taiwan, the secret troop is uh, an example of his duplicity, let's face it. I don't want to be quoted out of context here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's total nonsense. Uh, it was extensively as discussed as it should be. But let me I think you meant to say the sophistication of his thinking. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that, when Henry calls me tomorrow, that's what I'll say. <laughs> uh, but let me make a point on Taiwan. Uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is, by some at least, that we sort of sold out on Taiwan or we discussed things. Let's, let's think back of where we were. For 20 years, the Chinese said, we're not going to even talk to you about other issues till we solve the Taiwan issue. So we had these propaganda fusillades in Warsaw and Geneva and so on. When we finally established through the Pakistanis a secret channel, and I would help Henry write the notes to Joe and Lai through the Pakistani ambassador, and the idea of a trip came up, we made it very clear we wouldn't go there if Taiwan was the only issue. So they came back and said, we'll discuss other issues. That made the secret trip possible. Now, obviously, if you're going to open up with China, given this 20-year history, you've got to talk about Taiwan. I don't know why Henry would deny it, frankly. He should have. Because I think China made the major concessions on Taiwan and not us. And it's an example. We're talking about a strategic approach. How's this for Joe and Lai Mao's strategic approach? For them, Taiwan was the crucial issue, right? But they decided they could kick the can down the road, have a holding action, in order to achieve for the nearer term, there are two main objectives. One, security against the polar bear to the north, and secondly, breaking out of the isolation of the Cultural Revolution that's still going on, and getting other countries to follow the U.S. lead in terms of normalization, getting into the United Nations. They achieved both those objectives. We achieved ours as well. But they did it by holding their nose on Taiwan and kicking the can down the road. The, the Shanghai communique and the whole summit was about finessing difficulties through ambiguity, unilateral statements of each other's position, and postponing the difficult issue of Taiwan. We opened up to China. What did China do? They allowed us to continue diplomatic relations with Beijing. They allowed us to continue to sell arms. They allowed us to continue to have troops in Taiwan. And Kissinger reaffirmed our alliance with Taiwan on Chinese soil. Now, if that isn't China reaching out, and of course, we said we're for one China. We fuzzed it up about which China. And we did make a move. We had to to get movement with China. But my point is, uh, I would say that Joe and I showed strategic vision uh, and that they, they bent more than we do. Jim, let me just add one point on the, um, the, uh, on, on the emergence of China as a factor in Dr. Kissinger's thinking. Uh, the Nixon administration was inaugurated in January of 1969. Dr. Kissinger became the national security advisor. That spring, we had armed clashes on the Sino-Soviet border and that summer. We didn't fully understand what the background of these clashes was, but it was immediately evident that an opportunity had opened up for us that didn't exist previously of maneuvering with China because of the increased threat that the Soviet Union was posing uh, to China. So I think you can be certain that Dr. Kissinger was beginning to focus heavily on China at least two years before the secret trip he made to Beijing because of the relevance of China as an emerging factor in the um, Sino-Soviet relation. Thank you. Thank you. You've corrected a senior moment in my case. I should have decided that because I was in some of the meetings, even though I was not a special assistant. And Kissinger clearly was concerned about how we use this opportunity. So he was clearly involved then, I suspect even before then. Excuse me. We have a question uh, from Peter Thompson, who served with Ambassador Lord as Deputy Chief of Mission. Thank you. Well, I'll just stand. Uh, I went to state. I want to draw things back to the triangular relationship uh, in the 70s when we had the catbird seat, as you said. We had better relations with each than they had with each other. Uh, 
And I want to draw a comparison. Maybe this is on potential the road ahead to get back into the catbird seat. See, just try this out on you. Maybe it won't happen in the near term during the Trump administration, but it could hold uh, promise for the future. You could still say that each one of them value their relationship with us much more than with each other in just about every sphere. I mean, Putin's playing games. He's trying to uh, show an alignment with China against the United States. But when push comes to shove, you look at the relationship between Russia and us, what we can do to them still, and you look at our economic relationship with China. But that goes into other areas as well. Then there's also, I don't want to take too much time, but I'd say that uh, they have potential areas of friction. Right now, Central Asia is kind of a buffer between them. But I was in a delegation that was in uh, Kazakhstan not long ago when the central bank chairman told us that he expects in a decade to be in the Chinese Yuan zone. Now, Russia also sees that near broad area of Central Asia as it's in, in its imperial, uh, imperium. Certainly, Putin does. Uh, and a last uh, factor is India. India was not much of a, a factor uh, during the 70s, but now India, too, is a rising power with a lot of uh, potential uh, outreach further into Asia with the Blue Water Navy, et cetera. So I'll stop there. Again, the main yeah, question I, I is want, what's the difference? I want State to uh, – State, by the way, was in our Moscow embassy when we opened up to China, so he saw this very clearly from the, the Soviet – perspective. I, I agree. By the way, I don't want to single anybody out here because I've worked with so many of you, but Thompson had the misfortune of being by definition not only in Beijing but in EAP, so <laughs> this man has suffered a lot just like I suffered under, under Kissinger, and I've always appreciated it. Uh, I fully agree with your analysis and therefore your, uh, your question. The, Ch the Chinese and the Soviets or the Russians are cooperating for tactical reasons. They don't want the world to be run by the U.S. superpower. Uh, they agree on the lack of human rights, and here they have agreement with Trump. Uh, and uh, uh, there's tactical ways they can, and they're working together on Iran and uh, other issues, uh, So and UN votes. Uh, so, so there's no question, and against human rights in the UN, that they have tactical agreements. Uh, but I believe their historical enmity, the lack of chemistry, that big open Soviet land with Chinese population, uh, the fact they have no economic interests really with each other, so perhaps energy, compared to their interests with us in each case, that this needn't, I, I'm not all that concerned about their ganging up on us in any strategic sense, and I think over time with an intelligent policy, uh, we, I don't know we get back in the catbird seat, but we can certainly make sure there's no grand alliance against this, but let me give State the last word here. No, just very briefly, uh, I think it's still, holds true that their bilateral relations with us may be more important than the bilateral relationship there. I think it's less the case in the Soviet um, uh, side now. But it shows the unwisdom and the lack of strategic vision in talking about delinking ourselves from the Chinese economy and pursuing a course that will reduce the interests on the part of China in putting up with a difficult United States because of the importance of the relationship to them. This is what I consider total strategic myopia because no one's focusing adequately on how this impacts on our uh, role in the world. Uh, this is a mistake that Nixon and Kissinger would not make they would immediately understand. And also, they would understand the fact that we have driven this, uh, Russia into the arms of China uh, through the confrontation over Ukraine uh, and the NATO confrontation uh, with, with Russia there. Uh, you find very little consideration given to that factor in the way that we're looking at our European strategy. Uh, so again, one asks, where's the strategic vision? China has laid out goals for 2021, 2025, 2035, 2049. What presidential candidate is putting forward a vision of where they would like to see the United States 10, 15, 20, 25 years down the road? Uh, 
our strategic vision at the moment is one of our biggest, uh, or the absence of a strategic vision is one of our biggest liabilities. We have time for one more question. Yes. Uh, Peter got most, most of them, but I'll um, ask one more. Uh, three words you don't hear in Washington very much these days is, uh, and then what? Um, and, and I'd like for you to comment upon um, the areas in the world that uh, might be strategic flashpoints where we might have a conflict that would uh, raise the temperature in the relationship between us and China, Iran, uh, Venezuela, Africa. Are there places around the world that you see that China views as strategically important to them where a misstep by us could lead to a conflagration that we might otherwise want to avoid? Well, again, I welcome State's view. Uh, I think our biggest danger is, is miscalculation and accident. Neither the U.S. or China wants to get into a conflict. Uh, but whether it's uh, bombing the long embassy or planes colliding, uh, things can happen. And the China aggressiveness in the South China Sea has mean many more deployments by us, and I'm happy to say allies. And I give Trump credit for stepping up uh, operations there, including joint operations. By the way, exercises are more effective than uh, freedom of navigation, but I won't get into detail on that. So I, I do think there's, uh, there's a danger of miscalculation, but clearly neither side wants war for obvious reasons, the tremendous havoc and the loss of life, the, the wreck of their economies, and so on. I mean, it's too obvious to go into. So I think it's a matter of managing uh, these delicate areas. Now, you mentioned what are the flashpoints. Well, Iran wouldn't be with China, because there is a danger now with Iran stumbling into that. And we'll see, by tomorrow, I think, I'm sure, Trump will be a peacemaker again. But uh, the, the, the problem there is that you could have an uh, accident lead. So it's the same with China. I don't think they'll attack Taiwan. I don't think they could take Taiwan if they attacked it. But uh, they are squeezing Taiwan. And there is, that is so important to the Chinese that whether it's a blockade or some other kind of incident, that we could stumble into. Uh, North Korea wouldn't be against China, but it could be an area of instability. Uh, so I'm not worried about war with China, frankly. And I think we, and it is important, even in these difficult times with China, and I yield to no one in my feeling that they really have overreached and they're a pain in the neck right now. Uh, uh, it's important to have military to military talks to try to avoid. We've had some limited talks about incidents at sea and so on. Uh, so that kind of thing has to happen to, to head off the accident because it was certainly not going to go into war purposefully. The flashpoints are, uh, as, as what is touched on, North Korea and Taiwan. Uh, if we move away from a one-China policy, continue arms sales to Taiwan, uh, it's going to become a major flashpoint. Uh, and I'm talking at, at a big lo level. South China Sea, there's a potential for clashes, ships, uh, you know, raising tensions, but neither side is going to go to war or into serious military clashes over barely occupiable rocks in the South China Sea. North Korea, we don't, uh, when is right, China's interests in North Korea are not identical to ours. It does share the goal of denuclearization because it sees clearly the proliferation risks that North Korea having nuclear weapons poses in terms of Japan and South Korea feeling that they have the need for nuclear weapons. But the most important thing that I find lacking in American understanding of the issue is, imagine a situation where China has decided it wants to bring about regime change in Mexico and pursues a policy of not consulting the United States on the implications of either through subversion or through military intervention, taking actions that would have that effect. We would, as we did with the French Empire in Mexico back in the 19th century, have the ability to intervene in ways that would frustrate that. So China is an absolutely essential factor in dealing with the North Korean problem, whether or not they see things identically to the way we're seeing them so that we cannot ignore China's role, and we need to try to have China working with us if we want to have any hope of a successful strategy. 
Thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. Thank you to Ambassador Winston Lord, uh, Ambassador Stapleton Roy. The book Kissinger on Kissinger, Reflections on Diplomacy, Grand Strategy, and Leadership is available out in the foyer. Are, are you willing to? Absolutely. And, and they can be signed? I actually. Anybody, anybody who buys 100 books, I'll certainly sign one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you.